first days of summer are here, but for my small Minnesota garden, it's only been a few weeks since we've gotten most of our garden planted out. Summer though it may be, for many areas of the U.S., spring marks the start of gardening season. However, for a gardener in the north, it's a different story. In the north, we experience what I like to call frost to bloom gardening. The weather dictates what you can do in the garden, and a northern spring is a truly transitional time. We experience all four seasons here in Minnesota, and a Minnesota spring is characterized by numerous frosts, freezes, and melts from March to April, then finally in May, a tentative spring. This volatile weather pattern is why it often feels like we go from winter frost to summer bloom up here in the north. In a climate full of starts and stops, it can be hard to predict the best time to get out and garden, miss the mark, and suffer disaster. This year was particularly tricky as a mild winter with unseasonably warm weather and hardly any snow gave us a false sense that we could get an early start in the garden. However, as soon as spring arrived, winter seemed to realize that it had overslept and decided to make up for it with several snowstorms. Typically, our last frost here is the very end of April, or more likely mid-May. Our area was recently upgraded from Zone 4B to Zone 5A in last year's USDA Plant Hardiness Zone which means we have a short growing season of about 158 days with a projection of the first frost happening sometime in October. Even though there are many challenges in growing a frost to bloom garden, I've recently come to believe in the importance of growing your own food, even if it's just a few things. There are several reasons for this, including the rising cost of food, the ability to know what's in your food, and the satisfaction of growing your own food. In our recently released Utori digital magazine, I talk more about the farm girl movement and how growing your own food is not only a luxury, but an important part of modern day wellness. For me, I find joy in spending time outdoors and enjoying nature. Growing food is an added bonus. This is a journey I've been on as a casual gardener, but this year I've gotten more serious about gardening and I hope you'll join along as we go from frost to bloom. Although I have been a casual gardener for a while, I still consider myself to be a novice. In 2015, I attempted a raised bed garden with much failure, as another difficulty of gardening in my area is the natural wildlife. Besides birds, squirrels, and rabbits, we also have foxes, coyotes, deer, and wild turkeys to contend with. And there are probably more animals I don't even know about that call our yard home. For the past two years, we've had mildly successful container gardens on our deck, where we've grown tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, herbs, and some fruits. This year, we decided to go all in and set up a proper raised bed garden, making sure to take some precautions this time around to protect our garden from wildlife. It's July now, but my frost to bloom garden started in March. March through April was filled with seedling management. Like many gardeners, we started our seeds indoors. It was exciting to see the progress of new sprouts in the mornings that followed the planting. However, as the unseasonably mild weather suddenly turned cold, we began to realize that we might have started the seeds a bit too early. It's a common mistake that novice gardeners make. It's easy to get excited when gardening videos begin popping up on YouTube. We wanted to get our garden planted, but with frost to bloom gardening, patience is key. And even though it seems like you'll miss the timing, it's better to follow the planting guide than start too soon. Managing a large number of sprouts and starts can get to be overwhelming. We spent weeks with dirt covering the dining table, there were plants everywhere, and we got a gnat infestation because we didn't bake all the potting dirt that we used to start our seedlings. That's an important tip. We used a brand name potting soil, but we didn't realize that the gnats lay eggs in potting soil and getting rid of them once they hatch can be a nightmare. As for the seedlings, everything grew relatively well, though some of the plants were leggy from not being close enough to the grow lights. But the real problem came when we started building the garden at the end of April and into May. Our time and energy went into preparing the site. With the weather still somewhat cool, it was difficult to work on the site and get the plants acclimated because we had too many seedlings and not enough space. Eventually, some sacrifices were made. Some plants died. Toward the end, some were planted but weren't watered enough to sprout or to get stronger. Some of our starts died after being up-potted. There were some hard lessons learned in the Frost to Bloom garden this year. Next year, I think we will try to focus more on direct sowing as it looks like many of our direct sowed plants have done much better than our transplanted starts. Going back to preparing the garden, at the end of April we got a large shipment of dirt from a local landscape company and spent the next several weeks moving dirt from the driveway to the backyard and then eventually to our raised beds. For our raised beds, we followed permaculture principles employing a hugelkultur method. Hugelkultur is a German word with hugel meaning mound and kultur meaning culture. So roughly translated, it means mound culture. Hugelkultur is meant to model how plants grow and thrive in the self-sustaining environment of a forest setting. Though there have been no scientifically reviewed studies on the method, there are many anecdotal accounts of added benefits including water retention and more nutrients like nitrogen being available in the soil. 
Hugel Coulter was traditionally done in a mound shape, hence the name. But these days, most people use raised beds, which is what we chose to do. For our process, we laid down pieces of cardboard as the first layer. Then we used wood from around our yard. We're lucky to have several mature trees in our yard that drop quite a few branches. Unfortunately, we were cutting down a lot of invasive buckthorn at the same time that we were building the garden, and some of the branches got mixed in. It can be tempting to use buckthorn as a source of wood in the foundation layer, but the problem with buckthorn is that it is allelopathic, meaning its roots and wood produce a poison that discourages other plants from growing near it. We didn't want to risk having the buckthorn ruin our garden beds, so we had to be very careful in the wood that we used. We ended up with a mix of firewood and the branches from the oak and river birch trees we have in our yard. We also have a black cherry tree in our yard, but black cherry is also allelopathic. Something I didn't realize until I started to do the research for this video. So I'm hoping we didn't gather any of those branches by accident. For those interested in creating their own Hugel Coulter in the future, other woods to avoid include cedar, black walnut, treated woods, and willow. I would have liked to have had a more compact layer of wood for our raised beds, but we made do with what we had, and that, I think, speaks to the spirit of Hugo culture. It's about getting away from forcing nature into the pattern we want and instead adopting the patterns that we see in nature. The purpose of the wood layer is to absorb water and then over time release the water into the soil to reduce the need to water. So once the wood layer was down, we topped it off with dried leaves that had collected in our yard from last year's fall. The dried leaves add nitrogen to the soil as they decompose. After that, it was time to add the dirt. For our soil mixture, we blended the soil with two composts and then filled the beds up to the top. Another fun thing we discovered while building out the garden is all the wild edibles we already had growing in our yard. I've had an interest in foraging but haven't really explored it before. We've honestly let our yard go wild for the past few years, so getting out into the yard instead of gardening on the deck led to a lot of questions about what exactly was growing out there. What we've discovered is that our once perfectly manicured lawn has been taken over by a whole host of flora and fauna and is happily wild and out. So with the help of Google Lens, which is not a sponsor or anything, just what I've been using whenever I wonder, what is that? I have been able to ID a lot of cool plants, many of which would be recognized as food to a knowledgeable forager. It was a pleasant surprise to find these forage finds already growing naturally in our yard. Many might call these plants weeds, but to the hungry and interested new gardener, they are happy coincidences. I found wild burdock, stinging nettles, and violas. I wish I had known that the violas were going to pop up in our yard because they would have been useful for a video I had already filmed about the 2024 botanical food trend. That video is upcoming on the channel at some point. With the raised beds ready, it was time to get planting. May 11th, we direct sowed three corn varieties, candy corn sweet, red strawberry popcorn, and double red sweet corn. We also started some early bantam corn indoors and transplanted them as well. I later heard that corn doesn't transplant well, but so far all varieties seem to be doing well and are actually some of the favorite vegetables we've planted so far. The red varieties have deep red stalks which add some color to the garden, and for a while they were the only things growing, so I'm attached to them. This is our first time growing corn, so we'll see how it turns out. It's growing well, but pests have been attacking it, so it looks like we'll have to use some neem oil to deal with the problem. If you have any suggestions for what might be eating our corn, leave your advice in the comments. Or if you have any suggestions on how to deal with the problem, I would love to hear them. We were so excited to get our first vegetable planted, but there was still work to be done on the garden. We got some pavers on clearance and put them down to create a walkway. We filled in the gaps with sand, though we still need to get more sand and finish that part. We only got a small amount to start to see how much more we will need. But in actuality, the garden is going all right without it, so it's not a priority. It would just help to absorb some of the rain and tamp down weeds growing on the edges of the raised beds and perimeter of the garden. By May 16th, we had gotten most of the garden set up and we were able to focus on transplanting a lot of our seed starts. I worked on our dedicated squash bed, transplanting our delicata squash. I tried delicata squash for the first time last year. We got a big batch of them from our local farmer and fell in love with them. 
The skin is edible, and while it's similar to butternut squash, it's a bit sweeter in my opinion. When I googled it, it was described as a mix between a butternut squash and a sweet potato. Unfortunately, while the squash were growing really well in their starts, I think that they went through some transplant shock. They have diminished quite a bit, and I have replaced a few of them with other starts we didn't have the space to plant out. Because there was a lot going on with building out the garden, we didn't get a chance to fertilize right away, and we've been getting above average rain, which also washed away the initial fertilization we did get in. The bed has sort of stabilized, but the delicata squash are still struggling. So I hope we end up getting some. I also planted out azuki beans, which I'm excited about. I hope this turns out alright because I love azuki beans. If you haven't seen the video yet, I used azuki beans in our Tasty Global Flavors recipe video, though they were obviously store-bought. It would be cool to cook with homegrown azuki beans. These also suffered a bit of transplant shock, and I was concerned that they had grown too leggy in their small seed start pots. Since we haven't grown these before, I wasn't sure how they were supposed to look. Thankfully, after a bit of adjustment time and a few replacements of ones that didn't make it, we've got a modest amount that are starting to put out new leaves and become hardy. We had another big day in the garden on the 17th, and my 81-year-old grandma even got involved, surprising us all. She helped us to fill some fabric planters for our strawberry roots. So that brightened our day, and then she helped my dad who was putting together the drip irrigation system. I focus on planting out our melon bed. I transplanted some watermelon we had started indoors, added some Hutterite soup beans next to the Zuki beans, although to be honest, I'm not sure any of them have sprouted, so that might have been a dud. In between planting, my dad was also testing the irrigation for leaks. There was at least one, but it was really exciting to see water coming out of the tubes that had been laying around the beds for a few weeks. Since my dad handled that part of the project, I can't explain how to set up a drip irrigation system of your own, but I'll link to a video that explains how to do it in the description box. After some irrigation testing, I moved on to transplanting some potato cucumbers we had started indoors. This is another set of transplants that had either some transplant shock or we just didn't get them fertilized fast enough. They were really healthy and thriving before we transplanted, but soon they lost their deep green color looking more yellow. I doubt it was lack of water or lack of sun, so we're thinking the soil didn't have enough nutrients like nitrogen or even potassium and phosphorus. At this point in the process, we were just trying to get things in the ground, but later I was able to do some side dressing fertilization and it didn't take too long for the leaves to turn green again. They have bounced back and hopefully we'll get to try some potato cucumbers by the end of the season. On the 18th, we had a bit of a disaster when we realized we had missed bringing in a container of seeds back in and it got caught in the rain. So while we had actually planned to do some other house projects on that day, we ended up having to reprioritize and to try to plant out some of the seeds that got wet. So back in the garden we went. I direct sowed two more varieties of watermelon, moon and stars, which look super cool, black with yellow spots, but we might not make it with our short growing season as they take 95 to 100 days to mature. So we might be cutting it a bit close. I also planted a crimson sweet watermelon that I'm hoping will produce something. We tried growing watermelon last year and got three small ones, but they were also eaten up by squirrels or other rodents, we think. So we didn't get to eat any. Here's hoping this year will go better, but at the moment, I'm not too sure. This whole melon bed hasn't really grown out the way we wanted. I transplanted a few ticker melons we had started indoors, but another victim of transplant shock, I think we only have one or two left. I also direct sowed some ground cherries, but those haven't seemed to sprout either. On the sides of this bed, I also planted out some arikara bush beans and garbanzo beans or chickpeas, both of which are doing well. In the cucumber bed, I direct sowed Rhenish pickling cucumbers, lemon cucumbers, French breakfast radish in between the cucumber rows, and mammoth dill in the corners of the bed. At a point later, we also added some cilantro as well. Everything seems to be going well so far in this bed. I also want to mention that we put down hay on top of all the beds once they were planted out. This is to help with water retention and also help with pests and keeping weeds away. But a risk was that there would be grass seeds mixed in with the hay. We took the risk and indeed there are a lot of grass seeds mixed in with the hay. Lately, I've just been pulling the grass out whenever I get a chance. Last year we used mulch and then tried hay this year. I'm not sure if we will stick with the hay again next year or not, but I don't think the grass seeds are too big of a deal, just something to keep in mind. By the end of May, we had added some additional squash to the squash bed, black futsu, kabocha, and round zucchini. I also transplanted zinnia and spread some calendula into the edges of the bed since the calendula we tried to start indoors failed. With most things planted out, the garden door complete, all the spaces in the raised beds full, it was finally time to take a breather and enjoy the space we had built. Now it's July and we've done some additional work and modifying and fixing problems like shoring up our fertilization and getting some plant starts from a local nursery to fill out things that just didn't work like our planned pepper bed and tomatoes which didn't get big enough indoors to produce tomatoes by the end of the growing season. 
We also rounded out the sides of the garden with fabric planters where we planted lots of sweet potatoes. We also planted some raspberries on the other side of the garden. We've also gone around and added onions and a few other beans and peas to the edges of different beds to utilize more space. We've added a lemon and lime tree to the outside of the garden, and there are two other beds I haven't even really talked about outside of our fenced off area. But they have mixed success, mostly because I think the animals have gotten into them, though I do think we will be getting more onions and some carrots. We also got our first nasturtium bloom, which was really exciting, especially since those suffered in small pots for a while. I found there a hardy plant that has survived a lot and bounced back quickly. What's left to do? Well, we had hopes of building a greenhouse, not sure if we will get to it this summer or if it will end up being a project for next year. We also have to keep up the fertilization since we've been getting tons of rain. It may officially be summer, but it's still feeling like spring here. It's a bit of a mixed blessing. Last year we faced a drought and our plants suffered, so the rain is welcome, but it means staying on top of fertilization. We've also got to get some trellises going for some of our vining plants and decide when to roll back the shade cover we put up. And pest control. Even though there is still more work to be done, we have also been able to relax and enjoy the garden together as a family. The garden is ever-changing and it's so fun to watch it grow. Hopefully in the next video we will be able to share some nice bloom progress with a radish harvest and maybe even some strawberries, peppers, and cucumbers. Until next time, thank you for watching and remember, enchantment awaits. Life is just about finding it.